Hello and welcome to another edition of Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm your host, Deborah Milo. In 1922, the Maryland legislature directed the county commissioners to appoint six constables at large to be known as the Montgomery County Police. Today, more than 1,100 sworn officers provide full service and protection to our large suburban county with a population of over one million people. My guest today is Montgomery County Police Officer Anna Hester, who is joining us to talk about the county's current police recruitment efforts. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Let's chat a little bit today about the, the recruitment process that's ongoing with the county. I understand that there's specific qualifications and those types of things that involve becoming a, a county police officer. Can you share that with us? Yes, there's basic requirements. You must be 21 years of age when you, when you graduate the academy. You have to have a minimal of 60 college credits and be a citizen and have a driver's license. Those are the basic requirements that will get you through the door. Mm -hmm. And then there's later processes that will eliminate people such as the medical, psychological, and polygraph process. Mm -hmm. And there's different requirements for each step of the way. I see, I see. So as that process continues, can you share a little bit more about how, how that impacts uh, certain members of the community or how that impacts in a positive way? It's a positive thing because you never want people who are not physically or mentally ready for this job. Being a police officer is very demanding, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. And part of that is, after taking the test, you go through the background phase. And okay. integrity is always number one when Absolutely. doing a job like this. And so the background phase eliminates people who have done things that really aren't you know, characteristics of a police officer. Right. So then once you pass that phase, you're allowed to go on to the polygraph phase, mm -hmm. which is like a filter, another filter, sort of speak. And once you pass the polygraph, then you go on to your medical and your psychological exam. And in the medical, that's, that's a similar thing such as um, you do a treadmill test, you have your blood and urine test, things like that and it's also a physical agility test. Mm -hmm. That's where the push-ups, the treadmill test, which is the uh, stress test that measures like your heart rate, and push-ups, sit-ups, there's a sit and reach, things like that. And so a lot of people have the misconception that this department doesn't have a physical agility test, but we do. It's mixed in with our medical. And a lot of times we lose a lot of people there because people think 17 push-ups, okay, I can do that, but we unfortunately lose a lot of people in that phase. And oh, then there's okay. the psychological exam, mm -hmm. and that's the end. And it's either you pass those things or you fail them, mm -hmm. and then the captain makes a determination if it's someone he wants to hire or not. Mm -hmm. well, that first part about the treadmill test, that would probably stop me right <laughs> then and there. <laughs> right then and there. Tell me something, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in recruiting within Montgomery County for uh, officers? Well, it's not just Montgomery County that we recruit in, but even still, just recruiting in general. I know that myself and another recruiter, we do a lot of primary African-American recruiting, okay. where we go to HBCUs, mm -hmm. we go to African-American festivals, we do a lot of community service things mm -hmm. that draws the community in and gets our name out there. And what unfortunately what happens is people don't think the, the police don't have that same prestige as they used to have. And I think as time goes on, we've lost our prestige, especially with the things that have happened in the media, negative incidents of with course. citizens and of the course. police. And so it's almost like reverting back to getting people to remember how great this job truly is. And that's one of the biggest challenges we face is that people just don't want to do it because they don't think about the responsibility and really the glamour that comes with it, so to speak. Okay, wait a second. Glamour. Kind of <laughs> talk about that a little bit. I think it it's important to think about glamour not in the sense of the physical aspect, but right. just like with the military, police officers are celebrated every year, you know, during National Police Week, and there's a lot of things that people do for us. And when I say glamour, I mean there's a lot of great things about this job. We get really nice cars, mm -hmm. we wear a really nice uniform, we have all of our amenities paid for in terms of policing. So I see. 
when I say glamour, I mean things such as, such as that. We have nice chargers, we have nice SUVs and things like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's nice to be driving around in a very nice car of that course. people are going to see you in. Of and they're going to say, that's Montgomery County Police. Of course. So it's something, it's an issue of pride. It's something to be yes. very proud of. And yes. by the way, you look great in your oh, uniform, thank by you. the way. <laughs> uh, can you talk about a little bit about why it's so important for the county's force to reflect the diversity of the residents of Montgomery County. Expound a little bit about that. I think it's really important to reflect your community because it gives people a sense of comfort. When, I, when I've been on calls and people see me coming a female and possibly even an African-American female walking right. up, I think the guard is lowered. Okay. and they're not so resistant to what I may have to say. And I think sometimes it's cultural where maybe men don't want to have a woman helping them. But if they see a man that looks like them walking up, they're more likely to take open the up. help and right. open up and get what right. they need. And I think it's really important because it makes, you know, people make the world go around. Yes. So when you have a lot of different people that look like the people that they come, they police, it's going to be helpful because I have a different perspective of being an African American female, whereas mm -hmm. maybe someone that doesn't look like that person is not going to understand the background or the culture in which they come from. So it's definitely helpful to be reflective of your community in policing. There is a question that's been in the back of my mind that I want to ask you. What kind of challenges do you face in recruiting African Americans? There's a lot of challenges. I think that the history between African Americans and the police have uh, is still lingering. And what I try to do is make sure that when we're doing community events, mm -hmm. we try to make sure that we show that there's a positive relationship between not just African American police officers, mm -hmm. but police in general with the African American community. A lot of times people don't think that this is a prestigious job. It's a blue collar job, but there's they don't see mm -hmm. the other side of the rewards. Right. And I think that a lot of times when you're going to universities, people are saying, I'm getting my four year degree. I don't need to go and do that job. Of course. But it helps when you see someone that looks like you in his uniform, especially like at HBCUs, and I say, this is a rewarding job. I make a lot of nice money, mm -hmm. I have great benefits, and I'm highly well respected in the community because I'm doing an honest day's work. Right. And so I try to paint that positive picture with the African American community so that they don't always have it in the back of their mind what's going on in the media with the police in certain communities or what's happened in the past with certain communities and the police. So it's very important to try to bridge relationships with certain communities, especially African American community because mm -hmm. Wherever you go, there's going to be an African American community no That's matter true. what. That's and true. And it's important for the African American officers in the department to be a part of those grassroots community organizations that start when they're small and work their way up to college level. And we have an explorer program that does that with Officer George Stevens. He works with these young kids to give them that positive experience dealing with the police. And that still comes back to the pride, to the pride yes. and the integrity piece too, at least I think it does. Share with us what are some of the most rewarding aspects of the police work? There's so many of them. Um, right now I'm a recruiter in the department and it's not just recruiting for me. It allows me to reach a broader audience, and mm -hmm. I've been asked several times by grassroots community organizations such as the KIPP Academy down in D.C. Mm -hmm. and some churches to come out and speak to younger children about what I do and what the police is. And I think it's really helpful to do that because it downplays that negative persona that the police have, and it helps them to see that there's somebody that's the police, they're here to help us, mm -hmm. they really care, they really want to you know, see us do well. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's one of the most rewarding parts of my job. Even when I was in patrol, it's helping someone. That person is saying, really, thank you. I just didn't know what I was gonna do until you got here. Or somebody coming up to me in the mall and saying, I remember when you came to my house and talked to my child. And that really helped. So those are the things that I feel are most rewarding. I think that everybody has their reward in the job, so to speak. But for me, it's helping that person, seeing it through to the end, and then sometimes that person being able to come back to me and say, I remember you. I remember when you helped me out. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Or that changed my life. Or that helped me in a manner that I didn't think it would. That's got to be something that is so not only rewarding for you, but that's got to make you feel uh, pride for the entire 
police force. Absolutely. You know, it's in the sense that you're able to have, you've done something, you're able to continue to work in this process to make people's lives that much better. Yes. Talk a little bit about, and which I'm especially uh, interested in, about the recruitment efforts and about your personal experiences with the recruitment. You mentioned that you've been to different uh, places, especially to the colleges and universities. Yes. Can you talk a little about that? Okay, um, well, within the last year, myself and my now Sergeant Donnell Cowan, mm -hmm. uh, we have been to a lot of the African American universities, the HBCUs mm -hmm. along the East Coast, um, mm -hmm. Howard University, which we'll be going to this fall. We've been to Virginia Union, Virginia State University, Morgan, Coppin, places like that. I see. And there's other agencies that come there as well, but it's always nice to talk to these students and get them interested in law enforcement. A lot of people are interested in going to the FBI or going to the DEA. I'm sure, And yes. I always stress to them that it's great to have law enforcement experience before going to those agencies because it puts you above the rest. And even when I'm at these job fairs, I don't try to sell the department. I tell them about my job, the real life experiences I have, and what's the best rewards for me. And if they're not even interested in law enforcement, sometimes they become interested by mm -hmm. what I'm saying. And even if they come to me and they say, I don't know what I want to do, then I tell them, find it what it is that you love, mm -hmm. that you think about all the time, and do that, even if it's not being the police. I still want to see people succeed and get their degree and do what it is they want to do, even mm -hmm. if it's not being a police officer. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my reward system as well, is that if I can direct some young student into where they need to go, right. then I've done my job at the end of the day, because being a police officer is also being a leader. And if you can help them and show them that you don't have to be in this little tiny box or so many other places to go, then you're done, you've done your job essentially. Talk a little bit about what it's like to be not just an African American, but a, as a woman in the police force. I'm sure it's been very challenging for you and I also am sure you've got some good and po not so positive stories to tell. But can you share with us a little bit about a story that you have personally as a woman in the police force, such as, okay, I have to wear this uniform. This is not, this is not the shade of blue or black for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a challenge when you have a belt on and you have a gun and you have a radio and you have all these objects on your belt and it's, it's, it's heavy. And I'll never forget the time my beat partner and I were on midnights okay. and we were chasing after somebody in a foot chase mm -hmm. and it was down a dark alley and my beat partner was obviously in shape. He had been in the military <laughs> and he took off running and I took off running with him but then gravity started to sink in and I just couldn't keep up as much. I tried, but I couldn't keep up as much because, I mean, being a woman, you ha we obviously have things that some people don't have. Of course. And you have a vest, you have all this weight on, and it, it gets difficult at times, but that's why it's really important to be in shape. And I think as time has passed for me, I realized the, how important that really is to be in mm -hmm. shape and to look your best in your uniform. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many incidents that have happened, but I always get challenged by men especially bigger men, <laughs> and they always yes. expect for you to back down. And I think the less fear you show, the more pe respect people will give you, essentially, when you're there somewhere. So I try never to you know, show any fear, and I try never to back down from anybody that's Absolutely. getting in my face. Absolutely. So there's, I mean, there's so many incidents that have happened, all mm -hmm. you know, things I can laugh at now, but being a woman, you automatically assume to have been an emotional creature. And a of lot course. of times, you've had to check your emotions at the door. Mm -hmm. There's been times where I haven't been able to do that and it's been you know, a very serious incident, mm -hmm. just something that's close to home mm -hmm. and you wanna remember I have this uniform on, I'm supposed to be the police, I'm supposed to be the example. That's right. And sometimes it doesn't always work out like that. What is your mechanism when you come into a situation where you know that perhaps some of your emotions are gonna come to the top? What is your mechanism other than r reminding yourself I'm a lady in blue. What are some of the mechanisms you use to personally be able to pull yourself together internally at that moment when there's a lot of, let's say, high tension in the air? Well, I go to that place where I know why I'm doing this job. And at the end of the day, I want to go home. I want to go home to my family. I want to go home to my kid. And I want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And I think that I constantly remind myself that 
the minute I start to break down, I've yes. lost control. And losing control is very, you know, it, it's it can be deadly. And I don't want to be that in that position where I've lost control because I've allowed my emotions to take over. So I try to stand fast and say, I get through this. Mm -hmm. It's a moment in time in my life. Yes. I'll never get back, mm -hmm. but it's a moment in time. I have to push through it and move forward. Okay, I can understand that. And it's just so good to hear you say that because you definitely have the personality, I think, <laughs> to be able to pull that in. And I'm quite sure that you probably convey that. When you do the recruitment process, I'm quite sure that's probably another uh, tidbit that you probably share with uh, young recruits, if you would, when you're out there trying to talk. To, about this, about the police force. We're going to come back and talk about a little more. Oh. For those of you who've just tuned in, you are watching Mosaic, an African American perspective. I'm Deborah Milo, and we're talking with Montgomery County Police Officer Anna Hester about police career opportunities in Montgomery County. After a short break, we will be right back with more conversation about county police recruitment. Getting children to school safely is a priority. Do you know the rules of driving near a school bus? First, drive slowly in neighborhoods and school zones, especially in the mornings and when school lets out. Watch for children walking in neighborhoods without sidewalks. Be alert. Kids can be unpredictable and dart out into the street. Learn the flashing light system that school bus drivers use. Yellow means the bus is preparing to stop, load, or unload kids. Red flashing lights and an extended arm means the bus has stopped and children are unloading and loading. Motorists are required by law to come to a complete stop. You may begin moving once the red light stops flashing and the bus continues on its journey. For more information on school bus safety, please go to montgomerycountymd.gov walk. Drivers are at fault in more than half of crashes with riders, so give them room to operate. Use your turn signals and always look twice before changing lanes. Motorcycle safety. Think of the impact you could make. Welcome back to Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm here with Montgomery County Police Officer Anna Hester. Anna, earlier we were talking about some of your shared experiences, some of the interesting experiences that you've had while working on the police force. But let's kind of talk a little bit more about the application process, about what recruits, incoming recruits would need to know. Can you share with me a little bit about the pay differential about um, bilingual, having the, having the skill to be able to be bilingual? Talk a little bit about that. Okay. Once a person graduates from the academy mm -hmm. and they go through the FTO process and they get off of probation, they have the opportunity to be certified in whatever language they speak, whether it's sign language, Spanish, whatever language it may be. They can get certified with that language and they get a pay differential up to $3,000 a year. I see. Hmm. So it pays to it have does. multiple languages. It does. Do you emphasize that in the recruitment process? And do you also, by chance, emphasize to, let's say, young recruits, if you will, I'm talking about college age students, do you also emphasize how beneficial it would be to be able to speak uh, multi languages? Yes, we actually have a flyer that we put out at job fairs that talk about bilingual incentive pay. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of officers on the department that do speak several other languages. That's so great. it's something that they do benefit from. That's great. That is really wonderful. Tell me something, I've always wondered about this too. Is there a requirement for the police officers to reside here in the county? You know, in some places you go, some counties or states that you go, the police officers, it's necessary for them to actually live within that pr respective county. Is that true for Montgomery County? No, it's not. We have people that live as far as West Virginia or sometimes Pennsylvania, and they commute every day, but we have a take heart take home car take program, home car. excuse yes. me. And in order to take the car home with you, you do have to live within Montgomery County. Oh, I see, so that's the only requirement if you yes. are able to take a car home with yes. you. I see, I see. Talk about a little about the application process. I know we she kind of touched on it, but the application it's process itself, I know it takes a while for the application to be processed. Talk a little bit about timelines and about, about what the applicant can expect. Well, generally, the process would take up to four to six months 
reasonably speaking. Mm -hmm. So that's anywhere from when we open up the application process, we okay. will broadcast probably this fall, this coming fall, that mm -hmm. we're accepting applications for police officer candidates. And we leave that open for three months. Like this last time, it was open from June 1st until August 31st. So we're getting ready to close the accepting and applications, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So from that point, we test once a month applicants from wherever. As long as mm -hmm. they go online and they apply, and then we accept their process, we accept their application. Okay. And then there's a reviewer that goes through the applications to make sure they have a 60 college cr credits, right. they have the 21 years of age, a driver's license, and the, the U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. So once that's done, they're invited to a testing date. They come out and they take a written test. And then if uh, time allows, they'll do an oral board review in front of a panel of three officers. It's either pass or fail. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they move on to the background phase. Okay. And the background investigator gets assigned their case and they go through their background file mm -hmm. to look for discrepancies, disqualifiers, things of mm -hmm. that nature. Mm -hmm. And then they do an interview. And once they're passed on, then they go into the polygraph phase. Right. Then comes the medical and psychological. I know that some of these questions that I'm asking may seem a little redundant at the mm -hmm. time, but the reason being is because I want to make sure that we get the, get the word out so to speak, so that uh, listeners in the audience, people that have a chance to watch the program, will actually understand and be encouraged and empowered to be able to make the application process. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit about, uh, just about your experiences within the actual office setting of the police force. Tell me about a day. Tell me a, a typical day for you. Well, a typical day starts around 6 a.m. for me, and I come in, it's emails, people are calling or have left messages the day before, and they're interested in the department. Okay. And I always try to encourage people, even if they've not been selected for the previous process, to reapply because sometimes there's just better qualified candidates who have maybe right. more work experience right. or more law enforcement experience that makes them a little bit more well-rounded right. versus someone else. So I spend a lot of time talking to people on the phone or answering emails or initiating calls with people. And a lot of times we're out of the office doing recruiting events such mm -hmm. as the job fairs or community events and things of that nature. So that's like a typical day. Okay. And we all, all the recruiters have their own assignments. So. We're coming out with a new recruitment video soon. So I've been working on that project nice. for a couple of months now. Okay. And it's coming together. So Very hopefully nice. we'll be seeing that soon. And then we have brochures that we work on. There's the stats that we have to work on. Mm -hmm. Then it's just getting people all together. And there's a lot of work that goes into it that people don't see behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And when you think of recruiting, you think it's just all about the talking to people and going places. And the travel. And the travel, of which course. It's, it's a lot of work. And it's very rewarding when you have that one person that comes through and you see them at the test that day and they do well on the test and they yes. do well on the oral board. And the next thing you know, they're being hired for the class. And there's always that one person in every class that each recruiter kind of keeps tabs on. Mm -hmm. And it's always a great moment when you're seeing them graduate from the academy. I would imagine so. That's got to, again, something that has a lot of pride and makes you feel yes. good about that because you've seen them from start to finish. Absolutely. From start to finish. I have to ask this question. And so how did you, how did you get through the academy? How well, how did you do when it came to all of the uh, physical part of it? Because that's always a question. You know, we live in a society now where, you know, physical fitness is very important, you know, and lots of positions that we have, whether it's in a public organization or private sector, require, have a lot of requirements for people to be physically fit. And they even encourage by having, you know, exercise equipment and facilities available on site. How is it that you were able to maintain that? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, I started out working for the county as a dispatcher okay. um, many years ago, and I was encouraged by some other officers that I knew to apply because I had graduated. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about going the career field I had chosen, but I was already vested in the county. And being a dispatcher is very sedentary, so you're constantly mm -hmm. sitting and you're working midnight, so you don't always Oof, stay midnight. in the best of shape. Oh yeah, and. I'll say when I was going through the academy, I probably wasn't in the best shape of my life when I should have been, but the academy definitely pushed me to get in the best shape of my life, and it's something that you kind of make into a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of push-ups that you're gonna do. So you become very well versed in push-ups. And even when I was in college, I was in ROTC, so there was always push-ups to be done. But once you kind of break away from that routine and you're on your own, of and course. you're just sitting around, you get out of that. And right now we have a program where the, there's two recruiters in our office that once you've passed the oral board part of the, the phase, mm -hmm. they set up workouts. It's kind of like work out with the recruiter, so to speak. Well, Very nice. Once, once or twice a week, they'll have a group of people who are interested, strictly voluntary, and mm -hmm. if you feel that you aren't in the best of shape or you really want to work on the things that are going to be doing in the academy, mm -hmm. these two recruiters, they put on like a PT type of uh, class. Okay. So it's basically the standards that are set in the academy. They help you to reach and exceed. So it's a great program that they have, and it's something that we encourage people to do, especially if you're not sure if I'm if I'm ready, if I'm not ready, if I'm if I'm going to be able to make it. Right. And a lot of people do really well in that, especially with the ones that come consistently. They do really well in the academy because mm -hmm. again, you're going to be doing a lot of push-ups mm -hmm. and a lot of running. <laughs> a lot of push-ups and a lot of running. I definitely chose the right field. <laughs> I definitely chose the yeah. right field. Do you talk? Speaking of that. When you do recruit, do you have a chance to talk about nutrition? I'm just I know that's a really strange question to ask, but nutrition is such an integral part of the fitness piece. Do you have a chance to talk about that? Do you put the two together? Because there's always that concern. Yes. It's recently, myself and some of the other recruiters went to the um, Cooper's Institute of Training. Okay. And that's like a law enforcement class that focuses on nutrition and physical fitness for mm -hmm. law enforcement. And it's a week long class mm -hmm. and it's a lot of information that you get during this week long. And it's a really big book and a, a hundred question <laughs> exam at the end. Oh my, And okay. one portion of the class talks about nutrition and how to tailor a person's diet and exercise regimen for them specifically. So it's something, a great tool for us to have because if we see someone that's coming through the process and they're struggling with their weight and right. struggling with their physical fitness, mm -hmm. we can kind of refer back to that manual and say, okay, how, how much of this are you eating? Maybe you mm -hmm. should cut down on this and maybe you should do this and maybe you should do that. So it's something that it's great that we're trained in because it gives us the ability to really help someone out if they really need it. Okay, okay. Last question for you. Talk a little bit about the video that you were talking about earlier. The new video that's mm -hmm. coming out? Well, the new video that's coming out is very, it's very action filled, I would say. Um, it's one of those things where the, our captain, Captain Patil, mm -hmm. he was very focused on making it diverse, as well as the chief. I know the chief is very, very important. In, you know, yes. he's in, um, you know, emphasized the importance yes. of diversity in a department. And the goal was to make it as diverse as possible so that when people are seeing this video for the first time, not knowing anything about Montgomery County, mm -hmm. and they're coming from other agencies or coming from other states, they're gonna see this video and they're gonna say, okay, there's, there's somebody that looks like me in this video and there's somebody that exactly. looks like me that's doing this job. Exactly. Okay, you've got my attention. And it highlights all the best parts of the department. Mm -hmm. Benefits, salary, mm -hmm. training, cars, firearms, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of action filled and it's attention grabbing and it's really technology advanced because before, um, I'm not sure what, what definition you would use, but it's kind of like high definition, almost on okay. the verge of like HD. <laughs> HD. So not the tube TV type of right. thing, but it's very like vivid and color and everything. And it looks really good. And I think it's something the department is going to be really, really proud of. That sounds wonderful. Well, Anna, I've certainly enjoyed talking to you today, and I learned so much about the requirements for the recruitment process, knowing that I don't fit them, <laughs> which is okay, which is really okay. But I wanted to thank you for coming thank onto you. Mosaic and just sharing with us, because again, I think that this is an important initiative, and I think it's great that you have such a positive outlook, and keep that positive outlook when you talk to those young people out there, you know, to, about the process. I'm sure that they'll be happy to meet you and see you coming and they'll be very empowered okay. to learn more about the police force. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's about all we have time for today. And I want to thank our guest, Montgomery County Police Officer Anna Hester for being with us. I'm Deborah Milo. Please join us again next month for another edition of Mosaic, an African-American perspective. <laughs>